welcome to another episode of DM TV. Tonight we will show you how dreams are being prepared. People think it's a very simple and easy process, but you need to mix up everything. Songs, music, random thoughts, love, relationships, friendships, all those ships. And if there is one person who knows very well about all those ships, it is Gael Garcia Bernal. Uh, welcome, Gael. Hey, hello, hello. It's all so nice to, so nice to see you. Srečko, you got such a, a fresh name. Srečko. <laughs> no, How really. Did they do it? How did they do it with science of sleep? Uh, the science of sleep, it's been, man, uh, I've been sleeping and dreaming a lot recently. Um, and I've got to say this because this is the only place to begin nowadays. I mean, you know, in all these monothematic conversations with all friends and family and everyone, uh, you know, the, the, the point of departure in a way is to say how privileged we are and how lucky we are that we are able to talk about all these things in our home, in a place that, you know, that harbors us, that uh, we're able to to isolate or self isolate I don't I, I, I still have don't understand the term maybe because I wasn't born like English not my first language but self isolate <laughs> in a way which um, fortunately we can do with other people as well and um, and this is such a privilege such a, a big big privilege and, and it's been a crazy time of course I mean of, of, of dreams and also of reality uh, of reality being more real than never before uh, I've, I have to mention uh, that uh, a couple of days ago, a uh, dear uh, colleague of mine, uh, um, a friend actor uh, called Mark Bloom, died from coronavirus uh, complications in New York. And, uh, and you know, we, one wakes up from, from the dream space where we can, you know, we can probably biologically even... Uh, so, you know, uh, solve certain things in our, in our biochemistry in a way. <laughs> and uh, we wake up and we are faced with, uh, you know, with good things, with life, with birds, with, uh, with, with the clean air. But at the same time, we're faced with this uh, reality that hits us very hard, like hearing the passing of a very dear friend or, uh, or someone that is close to you or, or someone having real complications uh, that span beyond... Uh, health also economically, I mean, socially, or some people that are stranded in other countries, you know, uh, like you, yourself, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree with you. I mean, it's, it's a, first of all, it's a total privilege to be able to talk to you. And thanks to coronavirus, actually, we are getting together again. So um, yeah. not necessarily, not necessarily the virus is an enemy. I think it, it depends on us how we react to it. Uh, but unfortunately, as you said with your friend, uh, very often it depends on incompetent governments and completely uh, uh, stupid decisions. Uh, but I'm lucky enough, I'm in Vienna at the moment, you know, there is this old saying, I think it's ascribed to Karl Kraus, uh, which says, uh, if the world is going to end, go to Vienna, uh, because there is going to end 10, ten years later. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. The situation here is serious. I mean, I'm in self-isolation, how they call it now, for, what, 14 days, a bit more, I think. Uh, the whole country is on lockdown, borders are closed. Uh, me and many other people cannot really return to their own countries. Uh, but at the same time, you know, this old saying that go to Vienna and it will happen in 10 years, this is not anymore true, you know. You can see what happened in Wuhan. It's now happening in other cities. Uh, uh, maybe not in the same way, uh, but... What I read from the newspapers is that some doctors are very worried that Mexico might be turning into a new Italy. They call it like that because Italy is now becoming a symbol of, of an utter crisis and human tragedy. Can you perhaps tell us, you are in Mexico at the moment, uh, what does the situation look like in Mexico? Oh, oh I know. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. No, but it is the, the very... Uh... The very difficult uh, thing to to I mean the the very complex thing to to talk about of course because um, you know like uh, on a recent interview from the the representatives of the um, uh, Organización Mundial de la Salud the, the World Health Organization here in in Mexico they were saying that obviously the the you know the the recipe the perfect recipe doesn't exist um, 
so as how to approach this, how to solve this immediately. Uh, yes, there are great examples of, of places that have, you know, managed to, you know, to to interact uh, positively with their context and actually achieve some goals. Uh, I mean, uh, Italy is a is a is an extreme example of uh, of action taken uh, way beyond the 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 expansion from what I've heard or read. Uh, the, the expansion of the of the virus in in uh, in a typical pneumonia, no, that were happening in the hospitals. They were already. I mean, the action was taken afterwards in a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, Mexico is taking it is is taking action before that. Uh, and the action is more similar because we have to say it is more similar. It is not the same, of oh. course, because it is a very different context. But it is more similar to what. South Korea, in a way, is doing uh, aside from the testing, whatever you know, this kind of thing. Uh, basically, uh, I mean, let's let's take into account that Latin America as a whole, we're we're more used to uh, to this, let's say, uh, yeah, from disasters to viruses. And I'm not bragging about it. I mean, it is not nothing to brag about, of course. But at the same time, it gives us a certain kind of you know, an approach, like another type of resilient approach, which uh, forces us to to engage with the context in a much more, you know, uh, much more thorough way, in a way, um, and also um, trying not to panic at the beginning, because of course we we feel the fear. Everybody's afraid of this, uh, but you know, this has been kind of with communication and with information, we've managed to to understand it a little bit more. So. Uh, those are the two extremes I've been I've been seeing in in Latin America, or I'd say in the Western world, are being taken. No, um, two extremes out of three. The, the third one I'll mention it afterwards. But uh, the, the the two extremes are are uh, what Mexico is doing, which is a much more, you know, a information kind of, uh, you know, may, maybe uh, like tacitly saying. Uh, you know what, uh, if you feel a little bit bad, maybe you have it, isolate. Uh, let, let, let's no point of, of uh, it's no point of, of testing. Let's act like we all have it or like we all could get it. So let's just stay home, uh, which is basically ultimately, you know, what solves things uh, really. I mean, I, some say the testing and, and isolating and kind of finding out where the hot spots are or whatever, but you know, to, to take action really straight on is to say, okay, let's all go home, no? For a, for, a, for for the moment, and um, and the other extreme would be would be uh, what Argentina is doing, which is uh, basically Argentina is, is taking very strict measures that are uh, in a way locking up the country in in many ways, which are really, really some of them really hardcore, like uh, like not even allowing uh, Argentinians to go into Argentina right now uh, for until the thirty first of March apparently. And uh, and obviously this leaves many people stranded, and this is this is kind of unusual to 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 hear about, you know, uh, your own country not letting you in is is oh. is quite an extreme thing, no? Um, but uh, you know, at the same time, th those two those two points of view are really valid in the, in this uh, in this situation. I mean, valid in the sense that they have arguments uh, for and against those. Um, obviously. As time evolves, we'll see how things kind of, uh, uh, you know, evolve or, or hopefully um, naturally make, make, become better. Uh, but there are other, the third example of what the Western world is taking is the example of, of, uh, of Boris Johnson, uh, Trump and, and Bolsonaro, what they're doing, which is kind of ridiculous. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's like you know, it, it's one that we're like in... in uh, in a Miss Universe pageant, when when they ask a uh, uh, Miss Universe pageant like, how would you solve world peace or whatever, you know? And the answer is actually the answers are far much more thorough and much more interesting than than what Trump or Bolsonaro or Boris Johnson would a would answer, you know. And immediately <laughs> there is a much more uh, I don't know there is a much more thorough approach in a way, uh, but their answers are quite like short sighted and quite like you know stupid and and actually comical and if. If it wasn't so dramatic, the situation, but um, but yeah, so th those are those are that's more or less how I'm seeing things in terms of in Latin America, you know, and and this is what we're debating all the time. Uh, one angle wants much more harder, uh, you know, strenuous um, 
decisions and the other ones a more, much more information, more lax kind of uh, approach, um, which I, I mean, you know, there is this thing in, in uh, there is this thing that I started to uh, listen to your other interviews and your other programs, your other editions of, <laughs> of DMTV is that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I've heard a lot of this decision of, of the doctors making the most horrendous and tragic and, and uh, cruel decision is to say who lives and who doesn't, which perhaps is something that happens naturally in hospitals most of the time, no? I mean, at the end, we, we establish this institution of the hospital, blah, blah, and there is that point of saying, like, okay, who's going to live and who's not going to live? I mean, who, who doesn't have a chance, no? And it is a very cruel decision, but in a way, the decision is being taken there, you know? And, uh, and what's really, it sounds very dramatic, but it's not far from what reality is in a sense, is that this decision in Latin America comes further before and comes on a much more uh, political kind of uh, spectrum of, of decisions. Uh, there is that, that thing of like, uh, you know, the, the social approach towards this, towards this crisis is something that definitely needs to be uh, tackled. And, and there sometimes the decision comes like, okay, uh, maybe maybe it's better that that this uh, chunk of the population gets sick rather than having all this chunk of the population getting sick or all this chunk of the population dying from hunger or poverty. Uh, it is a very cruel decision. It is incredibly tremendous. But then again, I mean, the whole world is in this in this uh, situation, and it just. I mean, what this virus has has cost us is to see how fragile everything is, and how fragile all the you know the, the makings and and all this uh, you know the the organization that we've decided to live in uh, is you no know, with this invisible thing just little it's like a little drop that that spills the whole glass that was already spilling. You know? Yeah, but what, what I really like is uh, uh, this let's say so Latin American perspective, which you gave, you know, in this, if, if I understood right, you know, we, we've been through so much deep shit already uh, that we are resilient in a way, in a different way than other people. Uh, you know, uh, last Sunday in Zagreb, uh, uh, where my family is based and many friends, uh, besides Zagreb in Croatia being under total lockdown because of the virus, uh, an earthquake hit. Uh, the, the strongest earthquake in the last 140 years in Zagreb. And of course, the people from Zagreb also reacted in a very funny way, you know, because what, what is there but to make jokes about it. And when I told it to my friend from Guatemala, uh, she said, you know, I said, I sent a message next day and I said, you know, but it wasn't one earthquake, it was 30 earthquakes. And then she said, oh, you know, we in Guatemala, we live with earthquakes every day, you know, we got used to it. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I mean, I'm not downplaying the tragedy which happened in Zagreb, but in that mm -hmm. sense, it also shows what you, as we started, you know, by talking about self-isolation. Uh, I think in Europe, you know, uh, uh, at least for people who are uh, doing some similar jobs like me or for my generation and so on, uh, self-isolation is uh, not such a bad thing as for those people in Europe who are already victims of austerity or unemployment, and then, you know, my big fear is, you know, once this starts spreading in Latin America, it will, you know, even with the resilience you guys obviously have, it will hit hard because uh, for, you know, hundreds of years of colonialism, decades of Chicago boys, ideology, austerity, privatizations and so on, the, 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 the system itself perhaps is not so prepared. But at the same time, and that's what I want to ask you because you, you cover whole Latin America, you know, you're not just in Mexico, you're everywhere. And you've been filming recently WASP Network in Cuba uh, last year. Mm -hmm. So the beautiful images we saw were, were the Cuban doctors uh, going mm -hmm. to Italy and showing solidarity. Perhaps you could tell us something about that. And maybe also, how does it come that it's the Cuban doctors uh, who are the ones uh, uh, who are showing solidarity and who are equipped with knowledge uh, to, to know what to do and react in this kind of situation? Uh, again, no, it is, it is again reality hitting very hard as well because the, the reality is that there is a, you know, there, there is a very strong uh, medical system in, in Cuba. Uh, a lot of uh, doctors from Cuba live everywhere, live in many different parts of the world, uh, working for 
public or private institutions, you know, or, or I mean, it is a it is a cauldron of uh, of uh, doctors, no, of people that are have the have this um, this you know this conviction of their life dedicating it to to health and to and to and to and to solve illnesses. Um, and uh, and that is something that is incredibly real and incredibly generous, of course. And it is one of the yes, it is one of the triumphs of the Cuban Revolution. We have to to mention it as a triumph, as a definite triumph of the of the Cuban Revolution. But uh, you know, the the narrative, the established narrative of the world doesn't uh, allow that to 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 become or to have the importance it really must have. Uh, because we still have a uh, stupid, horrendous, ridiculous, tragic uh, embargo that actually has killed more people or will kill more people than, than, than this virus uh, in Cuba, which is, is this embargo that the United States has been implementing for many, 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 many years. Uh, I know that Italy recently, uh, maybe well, not recently, but um, a few years ago, they, they uh, took off themselves out of the embargo and everything, and, uh, and the relations have been uh, kind of Closing a little, no, we're getting closer a little bit. But I find it, I find it incredibly uh, general that it is, that it is, or and and very. Um, um, oh, sorry, my English is so bad right now. Uh, uh, moving, yes, very moving. That uh, that that someone from another part of the world is helping other people. The Chinese doctors are also doing the same. Uh, people that have been through this, people that are going through this uh, with their own special point of view and everything, they're supporting other people. And this is what uh, what also throws us into into this reality that we're talking all the time now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I find myself, every conversation I have, every single part of the day, is I, I speak like if there had been a kind of a paradigm shift of, of I speak from the world you know i speak uh, like in first person as the world I, you know I, I i i start from there and then i go into my context then i go into my my problems uh which is crazy i've never experienced that before mm-hmm. um i don't know it's it's a it is a weird shift no i and i think we're all realizing that that in a way we 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 talk to someone and we already know more or less the angles that we have to touch, you know, and 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 it is about everybody. It is not about only us. And I don't know. Maybe it is. It is a little bit corny. Yes, we're gonna fall into something corny uh, uh, sooner rather than later, and, and something very romantic in a sense. But I find that very as a as a as a principle an incredible positive difference that this is bringing. Yeah, me too. Uh, but let's come to that a bit later, maybe to the topic of yeah. of, of love, solidarity, yeah, yeah. friendship. Because you mentioned the Cuban Revolution, uh, uh, so let me ask you a question connected to that. Because of course, everyone knows. Uh, you know as well. I, you remember that you played uh, Che Guevara in Motorcycle <laughs> Diaries, <laughs> and there was this. I mean, sorry for the dark question, but I think uh, uh, this scene and your personal experience can be helpful to people. I think. Uh, there is this beautiful, but beautiful, I mean, I wouldn't say tragic, that's life. Seen on the boat uh, when Che Guevara, who suffered of asthma, uh, has uh, uh, an asthmatic attack. And uh, you yourself, uh, uh, are all, is, you, you're also asthmatic. And so my question is, you know, uh, what can, on the one hand, what can Che, Che Guevara, <laughs> I never thought I would ask you this kind of question. <laughs> In times like of coronavirus, <laughs> like a medium, <laughs> yeah. Well, what could Che teach us and his constant mm-hmm. near death experience? How to cope mm-hmm. with the near death experience? And what is your experience of asthma also teaching us? You know, uh, so perhaps you could put it in parallel with, uh, with the current global pandemics yeah. where everyone also has to protect their lungs and everything and take care, yeah. Well, uh, fortunately, my, my asthma condition was when I was a little kid. And, uh, and it kind of went away. Uh, I'm sure uh, there's someone that is uh, seeing or listening to this conversation and, and also have the same because I, I found it in many people. You know, that this thing of when we were kids, we were kind of asthmatic, you know, and, uh, and later on we, we started to, to, I don't know, to, to get away from it, you know, in a way. But we had it in our somewhere there, you know, and, you know, the, the, the feeling, you know, or the kind of the strange sensation. At that cost, and definitely when when portraying uh, Ernesto, um, 
I felt um, I I understood, uh, and I mean from my very exiguous uh, personality, I I understood a little bit, uh, you know the 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 point of um, how the asthma attacks for him was a pla they they became a place for him to grab strength, to read, to study, to uh, you know intellectualize certain thoughts. And then afterwards, when he was feeling better, he would go out there and take action in a way. Um, and uh, and back in the day, it was terrible. You know, the the, the you know the ventolin didn't exist. You know, the medicine for, for you know, expanding the bronchial uh, didn't exist. It was a it was adrenaline uh, sometimes that they would inject. And it must have been, I mean, if they, with the wrong dose, it might cause a lot of, I mean, talk about an adrenaline rush. That must have been the worst adrenaline rush ever, no? And, and yeah. uh, completely, completely uh, also, um, I don't know, foul, no? And and, uh, and superficial, no? It's like, you know, so um, I think that that was the, the point of, of, uh, of his, for him to grab strength, like what we're doing in a way right now. We're grabbing strength and we're, Putting everything into shape uh, in order to to come out afterwards from this way more stronger. Uh, the body is naturally doing that. Also, the bodies are doing that. You know, we, we biochemically we, we're doing that. And um, and so, what what would Ernesto think about in in these days? Well, that's the thing that that I've always uh, you know when we were doing the promotion for this film, I was, I was asked a lot about. Uh, you know, certain things like what would Ernesto feel to see himself in the T-shirt, you know, and, and you know, his face, and well, if he would come. And of course, it is a hypothetical, weird, strange question. Um, but there's one, there's one, one answer I have in a way uh, for that is that during his time, he understood something that I definitely wouldn't agree right now in terms of, you know, he understood that that the 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 armed way was the only way out. And I understand why he understood that in that moment. Maybe if I would have been born in that moment, I would have felt the same. Uh, but uh, but now nowadays, obviously, I I don't think like that. And uh, and I uh, I understanding that that you know in the in his context, what he saw, also how destiny kind of put him in the hot spots all the time, you know, and how. You know how destiny brought him to to meet with Fidel Castro here in Mexico City, and um, those 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 series of consequences in a way led up for him to make the decisions that that he or or think or or you know think about the context that we were living in and try to act on it. Uh, nowadays, uh, I mean, when when we were doing the film, Alberto Granado, uh, the the friend of uh, of Ernesto. He told us uh, at a certain moment before doing shooting the uh, the movie, he said uh, he we were dancing and we were there in the party and everything. And he said, "Hey, come guys, come, 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 come. Let me let me tell you something. Let's because we had been asking him a lot of questions, you know, and yeah. we had been asking him like a lot of questions about their journey and stuff and stuff. And he perhaps said the most modern thing someone has ever told me, and and modern really because it was a it was a an incredibly futuristic approach and generous approach he said um don't play us don't don't try to imitate our voices use your voices to describe your journey play yourself because you guys us being the same age as they were in those days you guys have much more information and much more a sense of the world and much more a sense of latin america than we used to have in those days uh, you guys have um, much more things to say than we had in those days. And he said, just go and tell your story through, yes, maybe use, uh, use us as references, but tell your story. And not, that ultimately was what, what Motorcycle Diaries was for me. It, it, it made me and, and, uh, and Rodrigo de la Serna and all the people that participated in the film, we all felt immediately that our home was bigger, you know, that, our, that the place where we're from is so much more big and and ever since then you know latin america is for me the place i'm from really i i i feel in every country in latin america i feel i'm in a place where i where i supposed to be you know
<laughs> I, I would love to say that as well, but I was actually planning to travel to Mexico, but now this global pandemic stopped me. But what I really love is what you said now, and it brings me to another point, because if you make this, uh, you know, that today we have to have our own voice, and that today we at least have the possibility, you know, Che Guevara and also other revolutionaries were, if they were real revolutionaries, they were always dreaming about internationalism. And also today, I think uh, precisely internationalism, but in the sense of transnationalism, and not just states cooperating, but peoples coming together, social movements cooperating, is more important than ever. And I think, you know, if, if, if I can make uh, one short historical parallel, uh, you know, unlike the Spanish flu, in 1918, uh, when, of course, the very name of Spanish flu comes because of the fact that only in Spain they were reporting about it. So the other countries which were censoring it called it the Spanish flu. But at that time, not just because of censorship, but also because of technology, I think someone in Germany or United States or Mexico didn't really know what is going on. You know, although the world was much developed than the 14th century when the Black Death hit and then also led to the destruction of feudalism. I think what is the difference today, uh, uh, that's why I find your, your, your words so hopeful, is precisely that uh, I sense, and maybe this will sound as naive, hippie uh, uh, stuff, I sense that a sort of uh, global awareness is rising. I mean, just look at the facts. Uh, like more than 2 billion people today are in one way or the other in confinement, uh, self-isolation, isolation, quarantine, those who are lucky enough to have a home or whatever. Uh, uh, and I think most of these people are going to sleep and waking up with the same thought. And that same thought is coronavirus, which then also goes into all other directions, into an assessment or criticism of your own government, uh, into criticism of the political, political economy of global capitalism, you know, which ruined the health care systems, uh, which doesn't appreciate enough uh, care work, you know, not only care work, but also the shop assistants, the waste collectors and so on. And I think this sort of global awareness is changing. Uh, although, on the other hand, of course, you have, uh, you made that beautiful movie, No, uh, 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 about Chile, you know, you all, I, at the same time you have the Chicago boys coming, uh, uh, um, you know, repeating the mistakes of the 2007-2008 financial crash in the sense that now you can see already how the governments are helping big companies such as Amazon or they are uh, uh, pumping in a lot of money into airlines or the cruise ships and so on. So you can see that, I mean, on the one hand, I think everything is still possible. But you can see that there is a struggle going on for what kind of world will rise out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and it is uh, and our tendency, maybe uh, making it day by day and everything, is to be a little bit optimistic about it, you know, in, in the sense that, okay, there is a certainty that we will definitely not go back to the horror that we were living before. And that horror can mean different things for many different people. But, uh, but we can agree on certain things. We, I mean, we can definitely agree. I think there is no one... Um, there still are negationists, uh, which is crazy, uh, but not, not as many as with uh, the climate crisis. Um, but but they are, there are uh, still negationists. Mm. And, uh, and, but aside from them, which obviously uh, incompetence or negationism is going to you know, show its 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 other hand and and, uh, and prove them wrong in a way. Um, I think that that uh, that there is this optimism of 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 us uh, and a certainty that we need a health structure, a public health structure that is that is strong enough to tackle this the events like this. Uh, this is something that everybody I think is starting to agree from whatever whatever point of view or whatever political point of view they come from they know that this is important because they can see how fragile it is that a, that a, that a health uh, situation can affect so many of the aspects that that you know that that matter in the that, or that affect them in their own skin no uh, let alone make the meal but at, at the same time make us i don't know it affects our our uh, you know the the it, you know i've never I've always had this kind of existentialist kind of uh, obviously crisis, no, and and, uh, and questionings and everything, but they are much more. They've been much more hypo, you know, like hypothetical or rather abstract in a certain way. 
Uh, the future is far much more like who would I want to be? You know, this kind of like very, I don't know, long lasting kind of, uh, you know, issues that, that, that uh, storm my head. But, uh, you know, one thing that we are uh, actually questioning ourselves is what's going to happen in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And uh, about our jobs and about, uh, about uh, I don't know, what we do and where we go or what we, who we can help or what's going to happen and stuff. <laughs> and it's, it's like, I mean, all, all those uh, kind of, uh, it's, it's strange how those, that existential crisis in a way has come, become so much more like short-sighted in a way, no? But at the same time, of course, with the calm of the night or in the in the morning or everything, we start to ponder about this kind of uh, optimistic uh, outlooks that hopefully we will come out with. Uh, obviously, sometimes the pessimistic things come across. Um, wow, it, I mean, fuck, I've been, I've been, <laughs> I've been very anxious. I've been, um, I wouldn't say depressed because sometimes the depression. You know, it's a feeling of you're the only person that's living this, but I mean, if there's kind of a little bit of a consolation thing about all this is that we're all living it, so you don't feel that alone in this. Uh, but, you know, I, I sometimes feel incredibly scared and and, uh, and anxious and wanting the horror not to, to become a reality. Um, but I, I, I stick to the, to the optimistic side most of the time, and obviously I think that that's what's going to end up happening and I want to make myself sure that I do everything in my hands to make this possible as well. Mm. Yeah, but, but I, I noticed with myself as well, besides the depression and going up and going down, you know, constantly and waking up and wait, you know, for me, for instance, one week ago, I woke up and I was waiting for the worst news about coronavirus and I get a message from my sister, uh, photos of Zagreb, you know, this kind of middle Europa city, in debris and you know her partner with the child so and i'm like what the fuck what's happening now an earthquake you know what's next yeah. so, you know i think everyone is waking up in that sense and you're completely right that the way we, we we count time has changed you know previously i was you as well uh, uh you know scheduling things months even years ahead but now i actually don't even count time anymore in weeks or days it, it's becoming ours, you know. That's changed. But I, 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 I as I was watching some movie clips uh, uh, of your work, uh, I actually came to to, to a very uh, silly, silly conclusion that <laughs> that most of the movies you did are in one way or the other way, uh, other way connected to a sort of disaster. So, science of sleep. You know, you you are Stefan who is drawing uh, a calendar. <laughs> Yeah, a calendar of disastrology. Uh, and then most recently, when we, we've been last in touch, I think in January, you told me that you are in Chicago filming a TV series about the global pandemics. I mean, what happened to that? Did you shoot it? Uh, uh, did you finish it? Is that going to be aired? And perhaps, I mean, it's called Station 11, perhaps. Is there any lesson we can take out of that Science fiction, you know, science, can science fiction have any lesson anymore today in this world <laughs> science fiction? Oh man, uh, yeah, well, uh, it is, it is, I mean, it is based on a book that, that I'm sure many people have, have read because it, it was a very, uh, you know, very famous book, especially in the United States. Um, and uh, yeah, it deals with this, it deals with what happens uh, a lot with um, with the consequences of a global pandemic, but it's more about uh, it shows us a little bit on on the edge of the future in a sense what happens to human relationships afterwards, and um, on a very uh, on the on the premise that the world has kind of the institutions have kind of collapsed, you know, like nothing is like we thought it was before and how this uh, everlasting sense of spirituality or religion in a way kind of um, blossoms in this situation. Uh, so it is, a, it is an interesting philosophical kind of, you know, uh, put into, into a game in a way that the, that the, that the story plays. But we managed to, to shoot uh, what we had to shoot before, um, and we're going to pick it up sometime soon. 
Uh, but uh, but it was it was meant to be like that. It was meant to be uh, like uh, we were gonna shoot a, a few episodes before, and then there was gonna be a hiatus, and then we were gonna pick it up afterwards. So in a way, uh, maybe that's. So, uh, I mean, this show was structured like that. Maybe like endemically, the show knew that there was something gonna happen. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And and it's something that uh, that in a way we've been talking a lot, and we had been pondering a lot uh, whilst shooting it as well because this was happening already in china very strongly oh. and um and there was this thing of like where well, what's gonna happen with this i mean it's incredibly timely but that that is not a, a longer a surprise anymore with fiction and with uh and with um and with something that i want to go for can i can i throw something but maybe just because you know man you know i've been i've been finding uh like we all have finding solace in certain you know, uh, maybe comfort is the wrong way, but finding the expression of love in in different um, in different ways, uh, I I find myself very distracted in a way, uh, like I cannot concentrate on just on entertainment. You know, I I I find it very complicated. I I think I've watched a few either series or, or films that I. That they just completely i don't know they they numbed me in a way you know and I, or i was numb already in a way and i've been connecting to something very specific um uh, which uh, elementally throws me into a very kind of you know a very strong sense of being uh, which is to play the guitar for example uh, and i'm very bad you know i'm i'm very bad but i love it and i love playing and, and singing songs and and and, and this kind of this this uh, this activity has given me a, uh, like an, an immense uh, meaning and and all, and a very moving meaning you know like the other day i was playing of course in guitar which one you play wish you were here because it's uh, you know it's like it's, dang, 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 dang. you know i mean it's kind of a good one to learn you know, to play and that's that song the meaning of the song if you sing it and you play it or if you sit down which now we have time to do. We sit down and we listen to it strongly, you know. And oh man, it 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 just takes you away and into many places. So I've been finding the expression of love in 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 the in the strangest combination, in artistic consequences, be it cooking or food or just really contemplation of the outside world, I mean, uh, artistic consequences being very close to spirituality and all of that, uh, and uh, science, you know, like, and science. Mm -hmm. So, and the scientific language. And I have a friend who is, uh, who is watching this actually, uh, who's a biologist, and, uh, and he's always, he always talks in this, two terms you know he's a he's a biologist he's a scientist but he's a very artistic person as well he's what he does has a very strong artistic consequences and he appreciates a lot that and he's always argumented the point of encounter between both between science and art and let's just call it artistic consequences because really i mean it's it's far much bigger no in a way and less self-defined you know I'm doing, it's not, it's not, I'm doing art no let's see later if it's art I don't know so I, I, I've been finding a lot of solace there and and, uh, and I, man I, I, how about you? <laughs> well I have a confession to make as well mm -hmm. I mean I'm not unfortunately I, because I'm stuck in a city where I didn't wasn't supposed to stuck I don't have a guitar and to be honest I didn't play a guitar since teenage years, which was also not playing guitar, it was hardcore music, so it was a bit tough. But I, I would do it. But to be honest, you know, also at the beginning, you know, I, I, at the beginning, you are happy a bit, a few days. Oh, there is at least people like us uh, uh, who are a bit more privileged. Uh, uh, you know, there is no schedule, finally, blah, blah, blah. I mean, for me, the first days were also very traumatic. You know, can I return there? Can my partner return there? Will I see my family? When will I see them? Borders are closed and so on. And then out of this kind of feeling of, 
I would say utter helplessness. Uh, we created, for instance, this, what we call TV, as you see, my little studio and so on. Yeah. And to be honest, you know, it gives me a, a reason to wake up, uh, to, to go and have a shower even, you know, uh, because otherwise, you know, what would be the, you know, I'm, I don't know, you know, uh, and uh, uh, to see people like you and then the comments of this show on this show were also so great that you see people uh, uh, because, you know, I think we are in a very interesting situation that public spaces don't operate anymore, you know, cinemas, uh, uh, Cannes, Venice Festival, uh, theaters, uh, music festivals, sports and so on. And more and more we are actually using these spaces as public spaces, uh, which I must, as a critical theorist and historical materialist, say that they, they, they appear as public, but it's still on a platform, you know. I mean, uh, uh, thanks to Zoom that we can use it and so on, who sees what will happen with it. Uh, but let's just be aware that also these spaces which we use now, uh, let's not take them for granted, you know, what, who knows what will happen. But through this kind of online space, I came also to the realization of what you call love. Uh, you know that, uh, uh, I mean, love in the sense, okay, you're in Mexico, it's what, it's one o'clock in the afternoon, I'm in Vienna, it's almost eight o'clock, uh, for someone in Berlin or, I don't know, Africa, it's, it's who are watching us, it's a different time zone, but we are all together in this, uh, uh, sharing our thoughts, sharing our fears, sharing our hopes, and also what I realized since the global pandemic started is, you know, the amount of phone calls I had with people whom I really love, uh, you know, just saying, you know, how are you? Is there any chance to help you? You know, the kind of emails I got from people. Do you need money, you know, or, or something? Yeah, yeah. Really directly, you know, if I can help you somehow, do you need an apartment? Can I do that or that? And you see that this kind of solidarity uh, is growing. I don't know. And that, that keeps me alive. Otherwise, I would also go deeply down into, into depression, you know. Yeah, yeah. man. Oof. Yeah, yeah. It's... Uh... And I think it's it's uh, there is a there is a strong relationship between between these discoveries and time, you know, as well as, as there is a strong relationship between time and being confined. Mm. Uh, this is apparently what's gonna. So it is a test of time, in a sense, all of this, and maybe the lessons that we have to take from all of this is not is not necessarily something. I mean, the most kind of evident. <laughs> uh, Consequence would be slow cooking. <laughs> no, no, not saying that, that that is, you know, but but you know the fact that uh, that you know in 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 artistic forms, for example, uh, you know it's always been said how the Beatles were you know confined to a place in Hamburg for one year, playing five nights every week, or six days, or eight days a week. Uh, okay, so <laughs> they were <laughs> they were playing uh, all the time there, and they were practicing. And for a whole year, they were practicing. And even though they were extremely talented, and yes, they born with the talent and born with the you know this gracious gift, um, they practiced and they had time to evolve into this kind of uh, musicians that they later became. And and uh, and. I, it is it is something that also time makes that and 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 that is something that we have to we're experiencing this right now. Um, I found myself also wanting to be incredibly productive as soon as this whole thing started, you know, and wanting to be incredibly, you know, like do this and that and blah 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 and, and put times and everything and everything. And and uh, I've failed, of course, <laughs> with, you know, with trying to keep that schedule. I've I've failed completely. Um, and and uh, my my daughter, for example, she she uh, she in her calendar she established uh, one for for the whole family, you know, and and, uh, and she says, uh, okay, uh, one of the strands of this 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 period of time, it's called time for peace. <laughs> and time for peace means basically do whatever you want in a way, but do whatever you want without nobody telling you, hey, uh, you have to do this or you have, or watch this or. Time of peace, of whatever. Maybe we need that. We need. We hopefully one of these things that are gonna come across, and certainly in, in in me, and I'm gonna change that in my own life. Definitely, I'm gonna give myself more time to do things and to this, uh, and and definitely to stop this crazy, um, you know, notion that I could be in any part of the world at any time uh, traveling. I that, that's gonna stop for me. For that, definitely, 
I'm not gonna go back and start creating it because it was affecting me strongly and it was hurting me even. And I found myself dry. I found myself with nothing to talk about to say anymore. You know, I'm not leaving. I'm not. I don't know. It's important. Yeah, I fully, fully agree. I mean, uh, uh, this time, you know, the, the, your daughter has time for, for peace. Uh, my, my, my friend recently told me that some of the parents complained, uh, saying, oh, we cannot anymore. We are all the time with our kids in the, in the apartment. This is hell. Can I sell my kid on eBay and so on? And then one of my younger friends said, imagine that when I was young, parents told me, you have to stay at home, play video games. And he said, I would I would think that I ended up in heaven, you know, that I died and ended up in heaven, you know. So there are also good sides. I mean, at least from the child children's perspective in that. Uh, but there is also a philosophical point which I think you are leading to. You know, yeah, Walter Benjamin in, in his thesis on the on the history of philosophy uh, has this nice image of revolutionaries after revolution in France shooting at clock towers. That was the mm. first thing they were doing, shooting at time. And then if you mm. would go back to Legoff and the Middle Ages, then you will see that there is a direct link between the clock time universe and schedules and the sort of capitalist realism, you know, that everything is measured through the hour and so on. And then you end up, as you said, dry and you don't have time for the meaningful things. So that might be a good outcome. But I talk too much and I can see we have lots yeah. of... And I would ask you many more things and we can maybe yeah, be yeah, a yeah. than usual. But let's start with the questions. I can see many questions are coming. So, uh, okay, there's a question connected to your guitar. In a way, uh, uh, you sang in the Oscars, your widow, Quiero Que Me Quieras. I don't know whether I pronounced Quiero Que Me Quieras has a lot uh, of views, uh, views. You did Mozart in the jungle. Have you ever imagined being so successful in music? <laughs> no, no, of course not. Never in my life. But it was, but oh, or maybe, maybe yes, very deeply. You know, like uh, the same way that um, uh, maybe on the same level that I wanted to be a football player. Uh, but I, I realized, you know, that I, I was a football player that yeah, kind of did it okay. But that my future was gonna be really, really small. I wasn't gonna have a. Uh, like a big career. It wasn't the talent that everybody would point out and say like, oh my God, this guy plays incredible. They would say he plays well, you know, and that was it. Um, uh, I, I don't think everybody would say that about me and the music and everything, but but uh, the enjoyment I've had with uh, football and the enjoyment I've had with music is something that, first of all, it's my right. <laughs> first of all, it's something that I... It's my my privilege in a way, my ownership. I I, I have an enjoyment, a particular enjoyment with music, that uh, that really uh, with Mozart in the Jungle, I think it transcended a little bit, and and uh, and I've had the chance to learn about music and also experiencing something that actually uh, at a certain point in my life I would say it saved me because it made me go into another you know, another language and another universe of, of experiencing new things, which, which is music. And, um, and that's something that right now, for example, is, is where I go to as well, you know. I'm so glad to hear. So after, after the crisis is finished, uh, we can make an online concert or even during the crisis. I don't know. Even, yeah. I don't know what you saw uh, uh, in Novi Sad, in Serbia. Uh, there was a, what is it, an orchestra coming back from the National Theatre. I think they come back from China, if I'm correct, and they came back to Serbia. They were all, to Novi Sad, they were all in self-isolation, and then they made a Zoom with different, and everyone was playing his or her own instrument and Bella Ciao. And that was fantastic, you know, you see yeah. people on the screen at the same moment, and you see that, you know, self-isolation doesn't necessarily mean isolation. You can even make art, you can even make music in in it and so on. Uh, Absolutely. Second question, that's a tough one. Gael, what advice would you give to the youth in regards of love in time of coronavirus? In, in regards of, of what? Uh, what advice would you give to the young people in regards of love, love in times ah. of coronavirus? Ah. <laughs> oh my God, you gave the title, you gave the title. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Maybe there is a there is a reference I can I can go to. Um, um, we were born when I mean we were kids 
when all of a sudden we heard about an AIDS pandemic, no? And uh, and back in those days, I mean, it was a, uh, I mean, and it was sexually transmitted. That was the the first thing we learned, no? Even before we learned that we had sex education, we heard about like it was sexually transmitted. Oh, and you know, before we learned that, and then afterwards we told they explained to us how it is sexually transmitted, no? And um, and obviously it is something that as a kid we kind of uh, we all I don't know we're very curious about of course normally naturally uh, but it got us and the whole humanity was deeply scared of how this uh, this was the transmission of this and how it was great and how they didn't know many things and how it was expanding and they didn't know anything and they said okay it's just this they came up with this notion of um, um, in in Mexico, it was a very common, but I think it 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 was in many different parts of the world as well. That uh, it was solo con tu pareja, only with your partner, only have sex with your partner. That's it, no? Like the, and the, and that obviously hit a very strong note in how the world was kind of going. Um, and in a way, we there there was a feeling of I would say that at a certain point I was like like shit, this is my awake, my sexual awakening, and I'm like stuck into, I mean, and, uh, and you know, the other guys had this chance to fuck all they want, you know, and now I'm in this situation where it's impossible to even know what is right and what is wrong, because I don't know, I have no idea, no, and obviously the lack of information back then was huge, no, and the, and the fears, and the fears that the that certain institutions, like the, the church, you know, was like, you're like, oh my God, you're gonna die. If you touch that, that you're gonna die. Or this is... so, so my advice to young people would be, we were born into something even way much more uh, frightening, much more that had to do with, you know, an integral part of being young, which is the sexual awakening, the sexual, you know, and, um, and in a way we understood and we kind of, you know, we counter or we, let's say we resisted in a way or we changed the dynamic by information, by eliminating the, uh, through many movements, uh, eliminating the stigma that existed with AIDS, with uh, obviously medicine made huge advances in this as well. And, uh, and uh, you know, nowadays we know what it is, you know, and, and uh, which by the way, with coronavirus, we know what it is. Uh, so that is a huge difference from back then. I mean, there was a couple of years that nobody knew and they were trying to hush it and silence it. I mean, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan and those people, they, they were hushing this kind of thing that was going on, you know, and they were putting the stigma on, on homosexuality and and, uh, and on Africans, you know, and especially, and it was it was terrible, you know, this, this whole thing that happened back then. So in a way, my advice would be like, okay, we, this has happened in humanity, it, it happened not long ago, um, but really with information and with 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 struggling not to be ignorant about what's happening, it is a way out, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm reading more questions. There are plenty of them, I'm, and I'm sorry to everyone because we won't have time to to, to answer every question. Uh, uh, next, join us next time, and I hope with Gael we will also speak more. But so go, let, let me go to, to another question. You mentioned Ronald Reagan. Uh, there, is, there comes a question connected to neoliberalism. So the, uh, it says uh, the coronavirus crisis plays a huge role on government ideologies around the world. Uh, my question is how do you think this crisis uh, uh, influences uh, neoliberal countries? Oh, well, I mean, it is, it's, I mean, like going back to, to a little bit what uh, we talked about and, and uh, in a way which you, we're kind of all starting to agree on is that is this thing of, okay, from all sides of the spectrum, people are agreeing that we need a, a strong health system, which we know health is not only, uh, <laughs> I'm ill, I go to the doctor, but I'm healthy. Don't, don't do that, don't, Gael, don't do that on the screen, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that was going to be a little bit. Of <coughs> there was going to be a little bit of coffee. Uh, so, so, um, I mean, this, this, uh, what was I saying? I forgot completely. Going like I, I the sneezing. Oh no, yes. Okay. So, the, the all those health is not only that. We we know that it is not only hospitals and 
of positive information, this is schools, it is, uh, you know, we need a, a strong public uh, institutions that, uh, that are free for all, They're absolutely, that are, you know, that make us grow into a much more, you know, intelligent and, and, and free society, no? And, um, and that's something that, that, uh, that uh, it's, it changed by the, by like a, like a hammer, no? It got hit like with a hammer and, and it changed completely. So hopefully, hopefully uh, many of the, of the old tactics and techniques of uh, recommendations and of formulas that, uh, that they've been, you know, technocratically kind of been argumented uh, no longer take place. It's been obvious way before, not, not, not only because of coronavirus, but this is the last drop that from the, all the drops that have spilled the glass. No? So definitely something is going to change. When, and, uh, and right now it's a think tank from the United States, it's this and that, and blah, 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 blah. You know, come on, the United States has that precedent. So think tanks couldn't prevent that, or I don't, you know, it's not, the recommendations are much more, we have to, to develop a holistic kind of uh, project. Uh, we need our, you know, our scientists from all other, uh, I suppose speaking about this with a friend, uh, our scientists from all our countries, which are kind of like on, on you know, um, we're from certain periphery, no, of countries in a way, uh, we need our scientists to come back <laughs> and work out something, you know, from for our our countries, definitely. Yeah, but but an important role in any crisis, uh, uh, art plays an important role always, and cinematography uh, uh, as well. So there is a question from Europe, uh, uh, someone from Europe saying that uh, the European productions in cinematography are now for the moment stopped. And what do you think is going to happen uh, first uh, with the global industry? Uh, I mean, Hollywood uh, and, and so on, uh, and the global productions, are they also stopped when they are going to return? And second, do you think that's the question, uh, whether this is a chance for more national cinema and so on? And I would add, if I can add a question, I always do that, I, I, I guess the audience hates me. Uh, do you think, you know, cinema will change after coronavirus, you know, how will it look like? Will it reflect on people how often they make a handshake or they hug? Will everyone just make movies about the virus? So maybe you can answer it in one, yeah. Yeah, no, yes, the, the, well, here as well, you know, and, and I think in most part of the, parts of the world, uh, production has halted from, from independent films to big studio films to big international movies to local, TV um, productions, it, everything has been stopped. And, uh, and it's gonna recover, of course, definitely. I mean, it will I mean, recover, it's gonna start again, no? Not on the same hype, that's for sure. Not on the same kind of, um, this need for content, you know? Uh, with that horrendous word, content. Um, uh, you know, because it is where we kind of become victims of that, of creating content. <laughs> to add to the ads, you know, to, to put it into, and uh, and what what we what is going to happen, uh, and this is hypothetically, but I've been talking with many people about it, and obviously in my in my experience, what I'm seeing is that the things that we're going to be able to pick up or we're going to do are the things that are in our own hands, that we don't depend on. Uh, you know, third party studios or big kind of corporations to say yes or no, you know, um, which gives us a, a, an advantage as well, because it forces us to, to be much more, you know, something that hasn't been talked about or that, that is no longer uh, a term of discussion because, because actors no, no longer talk about an, an artistic journey. You know, the, the artistic journey is something that is like from another time. Right now is about creating content. Uh, but the situation right now will not be about creating, will be about an artistic journey because the consequences of it will not be as, as glamorous, will not be as, as, uh, as, uh, as extreme as they used to be. Uh, it's going to be, uh, yes, productions that, that you can have in your own hands, that you can uh, do them. And a little bit what, uh, what uh, Bong Joon Ho was, was talking about when he did the Parasite. He said, I wanted to do a film about South Korea and about Seoul and about the neighborhood. 
you know, <laughs> about these two neighborhoods and I wanted to do this and do it. And then I realized that, you know, this whole reaction that it happened in the world and, and everyone watching it, I realized we live in the same country and uh, which is capitalism. And that is something that, that definitely uh, with, with local films, with local stories, I mean, it's been said many times, if you want to be universal, be local, you know, and nowadays we have to engage with our context because we have so much things to say. I have a lot of things to say about uh, in my in my language, you know, I have, this is where I where I expand. I don't want to waste my time like uh, uh, trying to follow a route of of um, of somebody else, you know, it's already there that I'm just filling in the hole or the void of some uh, that somebody's leaving behind or something. I wanted to do stuff in my in my in my own place, and and because that because I want to have an artistic journey. I, I really want it. <laughs> I mean, I I want to have that 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 my life has an artistic consequence. I I would hope that. Um. So I think that's more or less where where it's kind of mm. heading, and maybe the films are going to be much more personal after this. Uh, much more. Uh, even even though good films already are personal, no. A very personal with a collective, of course, of interpreting a point of view that is very personal. Uh, we are gonna go into into wanting to know, wanting to hear what uh, what a person from uh, Sarajevo feels in in this whole craziness, rather than hearing what a superhero feels about all this craziness. Mm -hmm. Because a superhero is, we can come up with with dialogues for the superhero right now and. And they'll be okay, you know. They'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. This this reminds me of of your own movie, Chicuarotes. Uh, uh, did I pronounce it well? Yes. 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 Oh, I, I will become, I will become Mexican. Gretzko. We are yes, exactly. We are. I, I think I also pronounce your name okay. No. Yes. Gretzko. There's the yeah, Yugoslav Mexican connection which we were discussing in Dubrovnik. What the hell? <laughs> no, it reminded me. It reminded me of your movie because it's also, you know, what you said about the parasite. You know that we live in one country which is called capitalism. Uh, we can see it in your movie as well, which is interestingly enough set on the background of an earthquake, and it deals with a group of people who are, you know, the lowest strata of society, the excluded, exploited, uh, and forgotten parts of society, and it shows how resilient these people actually are. Uh, and it's also a very per personal movie. Uh, uh, so maybe I'll come to the one of the last questions and uh, uh, which is connected to this. Uh, so the question is, Gael, uh, what about the poor people in Mexico, the, the ones that can't quarantine? Uh, what do you think that we all, uh, the ones who have it uh, easier should do for them or what we could do for those people? And I think it's a really oh, good yes. question. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um... Of course, it is a very it depends on many levels the the the, the question and, and uh, I mean it is very complex because uh, this is something that has been taken into account uh, definitely by this government strong and they've been trying to you know talk about it and it is a very difficult language to talk about ambiguities in in uh, in the social structures because uh, you know politics is not made of ambiguities in a way especially nowadays you no. Know? Um, and and in a way, we you know this conversation has been has been has been strong has been actually quite you know very high, highly strong in in certain areas. Um, but there is a, a feeling that that we can say that you know in in Mexico maybe five percent and maybe I'm being too either too generous or too small with my 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 account. Um, Five percent of the of the houses in Mexico are are not good places to be quarantined in. Maybe they aren't. Maybe the lack of lack of elemental uh, you know social uh, necessities are not there. Uh, one of them being love, for example. One of them being you know uh, this is something that because of the whole economic strain and the, and the lack of certain things, maybe love is something that. Is is a is a privilege to have, you know. It's something that if it if it's there, wow, it's an accident. But the norm would be that they, that it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe it is it is a very violent place to be. Um, and 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 this I'm speaking. I've got to say I'm speaking from my privilege. I mean completely. And and I never, you know, I never wanna, uh, you know, never wanna say that I know exactly what's going on. You know, it is something that 
but we 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 know it we know we know we know that can happen we know that those are that's the um, the things that are at play you know that's the situation and this is what we're the cards we're dealing with and this is this is a very very uh, interesting uh, you know concept to also take into account into this how to deal socially with this pandemic and uh, fortunately i've got to say the mexican government has and, and many governments in Latin America as well, with the exception of Brazil, um, have talked about, uh, you know, the the violent consequences or the the extra consequences that 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 this can can lead to, which is men uh, rather than working doing domestic work, for example, helping out, uh, you know, people that are in in strong violent. Um, uh, you know, uh, surroundings in a sense as well to uh, to to be aware of this, you know, and um, and so so it's been talked about, and 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 I think here where where people have most to say about this is, I mean, the people that have more things to say about all this are definitely the scientists, the profession, you know, the 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 doctors and the people that that uh, are into these institutions that are actually talking about this, and it's great that they're talking about this as well. Because if not, it would be, I mean, you know, it's, it is not the same recipe for what Europe in general needs, or what Mexico or Latin America needs. It's a whole cool. different thing. And, um, and it is important to always take that into account. And uh, I've got to say, but from our privilege, what we've been doing is helping the small uh, businesses and the small, you know, in, a, in a small communities. And also with new uh, ways, you know, with, with the social media and everything, we've been able to also reach certain places that are not in our community, in a very small community, that we can help out other people. And that's something that's being, hap that's being there. Maybe later uh, in the week or something, I'll send you a lot of links and things where people can see what uh, people in Mexico are doing. Uh, I'll, I'll try to include our, in uh, other parts of Latin America as well, but uh, I'll try to include certain organizations, certain things that people are putting together in order to, to help other people especially economically and also in the directly into the health situation. Mm -hmm. I think that would be great. And uh, we at the M25 would be happy to share it. Uh, we also had some proposals recently, mainly on the European level, uh, in which way to invest and use the existing institutions to provide security and some minimal wages uh, or universal basic income to Europeans who are now suffering. Because my big fear is that, you know, uh, uh, the number of people who will die and suffer uh, from the consequences of coronavirus are much higher than coronavirus itself. You know, the years to come, the global recession yeah. and so on. Uh, but since we have to uh, uh, conclude very soon, uh, maybe we should end in a kind of more hopeful way, maybe something about love. Uh, 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 what do you think? Arthur Rimbaud uh, famously said that love has to be uh, reinvented. Uh, do you think that this cri global crisis uh, will lead also to a reinvention of love, a reinvention in a better way? Okay. I Deep think question, I know, but... No, but, but, but on a very uh, elemental um, and kind of a straightforward uh, appreciation, uh, love nowadays can also be um, interpreted as, as work. Like what you mentioned in 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 the in 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 your book in the um, in the what is the name of in English radicality of love I think that radicality one. of love yes radicality of love and then um, yeah la radicalidad del amor which is a great title great title <laughs> oh, thanks man <laughs> yeah uh, what you mentioned there which you also mentioned and you paraphrase a lot and you and you bring in Colontai uh, no Alexandra Colontai a lot into into the into the mix because definitely uh, it is. I mean, the argument that love is work, is hard work. <laughs> it is something that we're all experiencing because, uh, be it uh, that we're uh, with a with a person we love a lot, and and uh, and we've been having problems, we've been having a great time. Right now, it is a test of work, no, and and of a lot of of work and and a lot of manual work also and domestic work and and. Uh, and so it is. A, it is a, an interesting thing that that that, that I think everybody is experiencing, and obviously everybody is experiencing that on its maximum level. You know, like oh my god, no. 
So this is something that will definitely change. Before, love used to be this kind of uh, immediate thing that either was there or wasn't. Uh, but love is not something, that, uh, sorry, work is not something that is included in this whole thing, or maybe it's included in post-therapeutic kind of uh, couple therapies, kind of, you know, conversations or self-help conversations or whatever. But, uh, the, but really, like right now, we're feeling the grudge of it and the, and the difficulty of it. And in a way, it is fantastic. I find it really, really great because it it is it it puts you know it puts it to the test in a sense, and it puts us to the test of like saying, of course, the same way that we cannot be geographically in some other place all the time right now, uh, we have to deal with uh, our love consequences and and the and the hard work that that it is. Uh, I don't know what actually in, in, on another episode I will ask you what Colin Tai would have thought about this time. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that, that's a tough question, but but I'm really yeah I, I'm ple pleasantly surprised that you actually brought Alexandra Colin Tai in. I, I think no one would have expected that the two of us would speak about Colin Tai connected to a virus. Uh, uh, what she would bring in, I think you 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 put it beautifully. You know, it's not just that the love at home, which now, you know, it's you can, It's not just you fall in love and everything is great and then the next day you go to a disco or to another country, find someone else, go on Tinder and so on. I mean, I, I don't even know how Tinder and, uh, and Grindr are now being used in time of isolation, <laughs> probably as well. Uh, but, you know, she was warning about against this commodification of love, you know, that love yeah. becomes a kind of product on the free market and the invisible hand will somehow bring you to the perfect partner uh, and so on uh, but I think today as you said you know first work at home <laughs> because we are more with our beloved ones than, than, than usually which can also sometimes create problems as you said and uh, the, the figures of rising domestic violence are actually very worrying uh, uh, on the other hand I mean love the function of love because Holland I was also writing about it the function of love in society because those uh, who are saving us now they show a sort of really unconditional love. You know, the doctors, the medical yeah. sisters, even the shop assistants. I mean, they don't love these jobs, of course. Uh, they would rather not do it, I guess. They have to do it to survive. Uh, but uh, this is a work which is a work of care for the rest of society. The same as postmen, uh, uh, waste collectors, you know. They are the ones who are now, at least in Europe, which is quarantine, they are the ones which are on streets. And this is a kind of not only care, but love for the for the whole society. I mean, some of them are forced to do it, but I think they are doing a very big uh, uh, job for the whole society. So, yes, I hope that we will redefine love. I hope we will see each other soon, querido. Of course, please, please, let's do yes. it. And, and the, when you said that it, nobody would expect that Colin Tai would come into this discussion also, you know, she was, she was the first uh, Soviet Union ambassador here in Mexico. Ah, oh, really? So, Mexico it was? Yes. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, didn't know, least, I didn't know that, but at least she didn't end up like another guy who went to Mexico, right? Exactly. <laughs> that was. No, 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 no. Thanks a lot, Gael. Uh, thanks everyone for watching us. Uh, as we announced after this show, uh, uh, we will show an exclusive conversation with uh, the one and only Noam Chomsky. Uh, you will take a break of, we will take a break of half an hour and then you can find it on the DM25 YouTube channel. Uh, make some popcorn, make love, uh, watch some movies by, by Gael, uh, Blindness, or <laughs> Science of Sleep. I mean, there are so many beautiful. I would suggest Science of Sleep because it's a Science wonderful... of Sleep is a good one, yeah. It's so About self-isolation, you know, two people in love yeah. are in the room and they... Imagination, artistic creation. Exactly. Thanks a lot, Gael. Hey, man. No, thank you, man. It's such a privilege. Thank you and, and hope to see you soon again. And uh, let's talk, soon. let's I, talk. We're I talking. Hope in, in summer, who knows? Yes. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.